In this series, I'm building a homebrew Sinclair ZX Spectrum. I'm using an EEPROM instead of a ULA, and I'm planning to produce a VGA output. But I'm going to take a break from the build for this video and answer some questions that were raised in the comments. Just so you know, I do read the comments, and I do like it when they create a discussion, and I do respond. So, please write more comments, it makes the series better. To build a new machine, I want a good understanding of how the original Spectrum works, and in this video we looked at the architectural transition from the 16K ZX81 to the 16K ZX Spectrum. If you haven't already watched it, I'd encourage you to do so, and I'll leave a link below. Really, the main change was offloading the raster generation responsibility from the Z80 CPU onto some external counters in the ULA. This led to high resolution graphics, and it gave the Z80 much more time to execute user code. This made the machine a lot better, particularly from a game's perspective. In a given 16 pixel window during active display, the ZX81 performs 4 memory operations, and the Spectrum performs 5. I came up with this proposed timing diagram, but this was more derived from first principles than actual data. Each memory access has a complete RAS and CAS cycle, which enables full random memory access per memory cycle. In the setting of the ZX Spectrum, it means that the bitmap address can be completely independent of the attribute address in memory. Now in the build, I'm using static RAM, so this is a little academic, but it may impact the number of Z80 wait cycles I need to insert to get the machine to act like the original Spectrum. Hopefully some people are interested in understanding exactly how the Spectrum works. This is the part you might enjoy. This is where I admit I was wrong. Let's go back to the basic 16K Spectrum design we went over in this video. During an active scan line, the raster generator is sending the address to the DRAM, and the associated data goes to the video circuit to be scanned out. If the Z80 tries to access the DRAM at the same time, there will be contention, and to avoid bad data being displayed, we make the Z80 wait. In the description for the ZX Spectrum Harlequin, I read that the video circuit hands control back to the CPU for the last two T states of the 16 pixel block, which corresponds to four pixels. So I presume the video circuit used up the remaining 12 clocks. Based on this, I kind of worked backwards and came up with this solution where we have four complete video memory accesses in the 16 pixel cycle with some leftover time for the CPU. With this exact timing, we can fit it all in and still be in spec for the DRAM chips. But in the last video, I noted that some address bits had been swapped during memory accesses. Specifically, V0 through 2 have been swapped with V3 through V5. Quite a few people in the comments noted that with this mapping, we have the same row address for bitmap lookups and attribute value lookups. Why is this important? Well, Let's have a closer look at the technical specifications for the 4116 DRAM chip that the Spectrum uses for the lower memory. It turns out, the DRAM has a mode of operation called Page Mode. If we want to do multiple reads or writes from the same row in the DRAM, we just use a single RAS cycle with multiple CAS cycles in it. Why would old Sir Clive and his team want to do this? Page Mode access is faster than random access. For the Dash 3 parts, it's 225 nanoseconds versus 375 nanoseconds. This means we might be able to get away with either more memory accesses in our allotted window, or maybe we can use slower and therefore cheaper DRAM parts. I wonder which of these appeal to Sir Clive more. Price is the key. Beg, borrow, or steal components. I looked a little bit closer at the Harlequin specs, and it clearly states elsewhere that RAS is asserted, then CAS for the bitmap read, and a second CAS for the attribute read. A new RAS signal is generated for each byte pair. Bytes are fetched in a group of four, two pairs in succession followed by a gap. Now I was really curious. If this state machine timing's wrong, what is the correct timing? I have an old 48k Spectrum, so I thought I'd have a closer look at these signals. Here's pin 4 from the lower bank DRAM chips, which is the RAS bar signal. For reference, each division is 500 nanoseconds, and each subdivision is 100 nanoseconds. Reading off the scope, 
we see that the cycle time is about 4.6 divisions, which is 2300 nanoseconds. If we assume this is video data, we know we have a 7 MHz pixel clock, which should give us 143 nanoseconds per pixel. So a 16 pixel block should take about 2286 nanoseconds. The 2300 nanoseconds we see is close enough, so I think it's safe to assume that this is a video memory read. Next thing to notice is that we have two RASBAR signals in the cycle. Let's zoom in on that a bit more. With the eye of faith, this signal is about 8.5 subdivisions. It's set to 250 nanoseconds per division, so each subdivision is 50 nanoseconds. This means 8.5 subdivisions is about 425 nanoseconds. We know each pixel is 143 nanoseconds, so 3 pixels is 429 nanoseconds. I think it's safe to call this 3 pixels. Next we have this period, which is about 3 subdivisions, maybe a fraction under. 3 subdivisions is 150 nanoseconds. Again, we know that each pixel is 143 nanoseconds, so I think it's safe to call this 1 pixel wide. This third period is the same as the first, or 125 nanoseconds, so this is another 3 pixels. Where does this leave us? Well, I think we can start to draw a new timing diagram, and I think Razbar looks like this. So far, so good. What about Caspar? No, not that Caspar. Here's the Caspar signal that I read from pin 15 of the lower bank DRAM chips. Clearly it has four periods where it's low. Now, these two signals aren't timed against each other. This is just a guess for now about how they line up. We see two Caspar cycles for each Raspar cycle, which is consistent with the documentation for the ZX Spectrum Harlequin. Let's zoom in a bit. With 100 nanoseconds per division, we can see the Caspar signal is low for about 210 nanoseconds, and we know that this is pretty close to 1.5 pixels. Note that I'm actually measuring from the time when the signals appear to change rather than the amount of time that the signal is actually low. This next period is about 3.5 divisions, which is 70 nanoseconds. Rather conveniently, we know that half a pixel is 71 nanoseconds. Based on this, I think each Caspar cycle takes about two pixel clocks. Now we know that RAS must be asserted before CAS, and this period is called TRCD. If we look up this signal, we can see it has to be at least 25 nanoseconds for the dash 3 part. They do quote an upper limit here, but if you read the footnote, this signal can be longer if you want, but the quoted maximum of 65 nanoseconds is to make the minimum cycle time for the chip, so 70 nanoseconds should be fine. Now I can put RASBAR and CASBAR on the same timing diagram. With all these half pixel delays, that means the state machine in the ULA needs to be clocked at 14 MHz but we know the ULA does receive a 14 MHz signal. Interestingly, we can see that RASBAR finishes before CASBAR for the second read of each pair. Is this permissible? This timing diagram seems to indicate it's OK, and there's no timing parameter specified. In fact, the documentation for the Harlequin actually notes this, so this is consistent. Finally, what about the fact that RASBAR and CASBAR transition at the same time? Is this going to be a problem? According to the diagram, this one looks like it's against the rules, because there should be a delay of TCRP between them. But when we dig a bit deeper, this delay can actually be minus 20 nanoseconds. This means RASBAR can go low 20 nanoseconds before the previous CASBAR goes high, so transitioning at the same time should be within specification. OK, so if we go with this new timing diagram that we've derived from reading the actual signals, this potentially gives us 8 pixel clocks or 4 CPU T cycles for the Z80 to have access to the memory. Does that change our calculation for the efficiency of the CPU while using the DRAM when video is active? Remember, I computed the value of 81% in the video comparing the 16K ZX81 with the 16K ZX Spectrum. This figure is based on the assumption of one CPU memory access per 16 pixel cycle, but maybe we could fit in two. Let's have a look. For back to back no op operations, we need 4.5 T cycles from the first wait to the second read, and we don't have that. 
Also, it means data from the first read needs to be available half a T-cycle or 143 nanoseconds after wait, which is also outside the spec for the DRAM chips. But what about read followed by read? This might be the case for a jump instruction where we need to read a 16-bit address. The two 8-bit reads for the address occur back to back in six T cycles. Well, that can be done in four T cycles, and the first byte of data is not required for one T cycle, which is 286 nanoseconds. This is actually within specification for the DRAM, so maybe this is the payoff for using page mode. I looked at hundreds of CAS cycles, and I only ever found one CPU access per 16 pixel block. There were some unusual patterns, but I think this is the right edge of the active area, where we have one 16 pixel block with the CPU access, then another CPU access immediately in the adjacent border area. I did find some shorter CAS pass signals, which were about two pixels wide. I think it depends on the T state of the Z80 but I never saw two CPU accesses in a single 16 pixel block. Maybe I just never saw it, or perhaps more likely, they didn't design this special case into the ULA logic, and only one CPU memory access per 16 pixel blocks allowed. That being the case, we're not going to see a huge bandwidth difference between page mode and random access mode. I measured the CAS duration for the CPU access, and it actually appears to be about 550 nanoseconds. This corresponds to 4 pixels, so when I add this into the timing diagram, I think this is a more accurate representation of the memory access in the ZX spectrum. So I'm struggling a bit to see why they use page mode in the DRAM. Maybe this design works better, maybe it was easier to encode it in the ULA, and maybe it did allow for slower DRAMs. Admittedly, my original design is theoretical, and there may be some hidden flaw that I'm not aware of. Given how flaky the 4116 DRAM chips can be, I don't think I'm going to build it and try it. Here's a comparison of the two timing regimens. The actual spectrum has more time for CPU access, and for some back-to-back -back CPU operand reads, the Z80 could potentially get two memory accesses within this time, but the ULA doesn't seem to take advantage of it. I did look for the slowest 4116 part I could find, and the slowest was this Motorola 4116-30. Both designs are outside the timing spec when generating video, but the spectrum design looks like it might be in spec for CPU reads and CPU writes. The occasional bad pixel on the screen for one frame is pretty tolerable, provided it doesn't corrupt the memory. But CPU reads and writes have to be correct every time. So yes, the Spectrum does use page mode, and this restricts the video memory addressing, but I suspect the payoff is that Sir Clive got to use cheaper DRAM. This is just a hypothesis. My Spectrum uses NEC D416-3 parts, which are rated at 200 nanoseconds. But if you have slower memories in the lower 16K bank, Please leave a comment and we'll see if this page mode DRAM based timing does support slower memories. Anyway, back to the build in the next video.